Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Creative Visions TV with your host, me, Karen Dahlman. Now, as you guys know, I haven't posted a video in a while, and there's a good reason for that. I've been going through a lot of changes and transition within my life, not unlike a lot of you. I recently also left Southern California. You guys know my board partner left at the beginning of the year. I left and went east, and I landed in the Grand Canyon State. You guys, that's right, Arizona. Super happy here, and hello, Arizonians, my new friends. So I know you guys are going through a lot of transition yourself and transformation, and I've got to say, it's either the alignment of the cosmic energies or source itself or the universe. There's things going on that's here to support us to become our greatest selves. And so what I find happening for a lot of people, and it started really in 2019, of course, 2020, the big COVID year, who wasn't touched by that? And even this year and into next year, it's going to continue. The idea is to get us into the right alignment and space we need to be in to be our greatest selves. And so what you might find happening is that mentally, emotionally, shifts are happening. You may find that you're relocating, not unlike myself. You may find that your relationships change, new people come and go, or maybe you've changed careers or jobs. So try to go with the flow. Know you're not along on this path, but you can swim upstream if you're like a salmon or something, but I suggest try to go with the flow of it. It's gonna be a lot easier on you. So speaking of flow, let's flow right into and talk about our guest. I have a really cool guest with us today. I'm super excited. We've crossed paths before at different paranormal conventions, but this guy, I got to tell you, he's very well traveled. He's been to over 40 countries. And when he goes to these different places around the earth, these places that I'll call them high strangeness, he does his own investigations. He really deep dives into what the paranormal history is of the area, and then he writes about it and talks about it. Okay, he is also a 30-year law enforcement officer, a detective, and has a 10-year military veteran background with the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force. Not just one, but three, you guys. Pretty cool. He's highly educated with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Texas State University. And he lectures, like I said, at paranormal conventions, conferences internationally. And he's authored also several books, nonfiction and fiction, okay? So I know his latest two are pretty cool titles. And they were published by, you're going to probably recognize the name of this publishing company, um, Visionary Living Publishing. You guys, that's a friend of our show, Rosemary Allen Guiley, and one of my good friends. But her legacy lives on. And so Greg has two books that was published by that company. And it's called Diaries of a Paranormalist Encounters with Death. And also, How to Be a Paranormal Detective. We're going to ask him about that for sure. Now, you guys, I got to tell you this. He is also currently works as a street patrol lieutenant. That's right, you guys. Behave yourself. We've got a police officer in the house. <laughs> okay, you guys are all good. It's probably me that needs to worry about behaving, okay? Got it. Okay, so without further ado, let us welcome our guest, the one and only paranormal detective, Greg Lawson. Hey, Greg! Thanks for having me on. Welcome. I'm so glad you could take the time. You guys, he's a busy man doing a lot of stuff, but thank you. I think you're in, you're in between shifts or something too, aren't you? Right before my shift, I go on tonight and in about two hours. Here we go, you guys. I got him for a little bit here. Yay. Okay, so I've got it. First of all, I want to say thank you for your service in the military and also for your continual service to our country. You know, I come from a background. My, my father was a career military man himself, and he was retired a full-brood colonel in the Air Force. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yep. And I got to ask you, too. I, you and I haven't talked about this before, but Texas State University, isn't that located in San Marcos? Texas? It is, yeah. Some people get it confused with the uh, University of Texas. Nope, but, that's uh, Austin. But I can assure you that uh, uh, the, the drive that you have to have to go to Texas State and the ability to be able to stay that drunk for that amount of time and still get a degree is, is something to be said. Listen, I, you know what? I never told you this. I used to live in San Marcos. Oh, really? Well, let me say this. Okay, I lived in Martindale outside of San Marcos. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now get this. My very first job out of graduate school myself when I was a therapist was at the Brown Schools Institute in San Marcos, Texas. Ah. 
I know exactly where that is. And you know, and I have a feeling our years might have crossed over when I was there and you were there. Yeah, I was there in uh, like, uh, let's see, 86 uh, to, what was it? Yeah, 86 to 89 and then and then much later because I, then I went back. So I, uh, you know, I, it was Southwest Texas State University yep. and then it got a bad reputation for being too drunk. So they changed it to Texas State University. Now That's right. they have a bad reputation of being too drunk. You know what? So. I, I, I knew the people that went there. By the way, I was there in 89. I was okay, there yeah. for a couple We see, we guys, we crossed over. We, we didn't even know this about each other. So nope. I know the Hill Country really well. I know San Marcos. But um, I was there for about two and a half years. Then I moved, moved up to Austin and then was a therapist up there and practice and stuff. Right. But we have that well, connection. That that's where I am now. I'm actually north of Austin. I'm in Georgetown. No, Georgetown. Yeah, I know Georgetown. Isn't that cool, you guys? And I always want to say go Bobcats, right? That's right. <laughs> okay, well, since we got that out of the way, I just want him to know that we, you know, yeah, is that the symbol? I forgot. I can't do yeah, it. Yeah, that's, that's it. I was going to go, wow. It's that. Okay. Well, ours was this. I was a Lobo, University of New Mexico. So anyway. Okay. Um, so listen, let's talk about Ouija. This channel, you guys out there, you guys all love Ouija, or at least you're curious about it, and that's why you follow this channel. So talk about Ouija. What do you think about the talking board, Greg? Well, that's, that's the funny thing is, um, you know, there's so many people that talk about, uh, uh, they see it and they go, oh, I wouldn't have one of those in my house. Oh, you know, those are, that opens the portals to hell, you know, and lets Beelzebub and and all the other, uh, you know, lower demons into your house and all that stuff. Um, nearest I can tell, uh, uh, a talking board, a Ouija board, whatever you want to call it. By the way, I'm wearing my shirt. Look, yay, today. you guys. He's wearing one of our TBHS shirts. Yay, yay, yay. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> needless, uh, I, I, it seems like most people use the boards as a tool like they use anything else, whether... Uh, it be in a religion and they use some sort of religious icon for something or mm. if it's ghost hunting and they're using a spirit box or something like that. This seems to me that uh, people are using it um, uh, j just like a tool like you would use it f for any other either religious uh, purpose or spiritual purpose or just ghost hunting or whatever you might be doing. So uh, I have seen it uh, I've seen people use it a lot in different locations, and I've never seen Satan come out of the board. You haven't, no. okay? That's good. I, I haven't. I haven't felt Satan as far as I, as far as I know, he hasn't followed me home, um, and I, I think there's a big misunderstanding on any of the talking boards like that. Mm. Uh, but it's all about what your, what your uh, values, assumptions, behaviors, and expectations are going to lead you to believe. So, yeah, you know, and, and you guys out there, you guys know I concur. It's all about your beliefs. It's about your intentions. And I, I, I agree with you. Um, so I see a board behind you. That's yes. actually a talking board. Wh who, which one is that? That is a, uh, um, that is a handmade board. Uh, I was at Warwick Castle over in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I, uh, I, I was at an event there and there was a gentleman there that actually has a, uh, uh, an association with Robert Murch, and he had a bunch of his boards there. Uh, and this gentleman very graciously at the end of the event, I didn't even, I might have said hello to him, but you know how these events are. People are busy and all the yeah. vendors are doing different stuff. And as we were packing up, he just walked over and said, you're supposed to have this and handed Ooh. it to me. Wow. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty neat because it's a dog and cat themed. Uh, it's a dog and cat themed along with a Viking theme, which that's kind of my background. And uh, I, uh, I hang out with uh, dogs and cats probably more than I do uh, socially with people. So <laughs> it was just uh, very, uh, you know, it was a really cool, nice thing to, for him to do. It's very, a very nice. nice board too. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have seen pictures of it up close. Thinking about it now, um, and I know the gentleman you're talking about. You guys, he's talking about Sage Paracon. Uh, I went there a couple times. Uh, you were there the year before I went, Greg, and then I came the two years after you. Yeah. And I think you're scheduled to go back this summer if it happens. Uh, if it, yeah. Uh, well, 
So it's not going to happen this summer. They've re oh. uh, rescheduled the UK to 2022. Well, uh, that's what I mean. Yeah, next year, right? Okay, right. We're still yeah. going to Virginia, as far as I know. Yeah, you guys, right we're going to be at Bell Grove. So we think we are. I mean, you guys, things keep changing. Uh, that's what I was talking about, transformation earlier. I mean, Greg and I are going to be at Michigan Paracon, too, in a few weeks. So hopefully that still goes, which right now it is going. So you yep. guys, get your tickets, come out and see us. But the Bell Grove one in Virginia, the only reason why we're, con we're concerned about it a little bit, right now it's going, so, so just know that's the word on the street, guys. But it's because the person who runs it, MJ, comes from the UK. So it's UK based ran, but here in the United States. So we'll see, right? Yeah, they have some real weird travel bans and stuff like that. And um, I, I was just, uh, uh, I, 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 I've flown twice in the last couple of months. Yeah. And I was just flying back to Austin with a lady that uh, lives in France. She was sitting next to me, mm. uh, but she's she goes back and forth in the UK and she said she can't get a flight out of the UK. So she had to go back to France and get her flight out of France. So it's all weird. Yeah, everything is strange right now. So we'll see what happens, but you guys, it's on our schedule. Um, so anyway, if you want more information on those two events, uh, and I know I know. also Greg's going to give you his information later. He has a lot of events coming up, but they'll be down below and they'll also be on his website and of course on my website. So cool. All right, let's get into this. I want to talk to you about some of your paranormal encounters. I mean, you've traveled extensively. You've had some really interesting experiences, strange, high strangest, strangest, I call it. What can you share with us? A good example of something paranormal for Greg. So I, I've never seen a full apparition ghost. I haven't seen, like I said before, I haven't seen the demons come out of the ground or I haven't seen anything like that. Um, some of the places that I've been are pretty amazing places and uh, people that I've been with and myself have gotten some evidence, you know, either EVP type stuff or mm. uh, photographs of something that's just really amazing. We were at uh, Lep Castle over in Ireland, and uh, that place, it was really funny. We were, we were driving along in a van or in a bus, and uh, everybody said, hey, let's go to Lep Castle. We're going to go to Lep Castle. I was like, what's Lep Castle? And here I am, the paranormal detective, and everybody looked at me like, oh, you should I know. <laughs> I'm like, I, you know, I can't know everything. Right. I know a lot. I can't know everything. But Lep Castle is, as you know, you know, one of the top tier places. If something's going to happen, that's probably where it's going to happen. And so I want to say Lep, Lep Castle has about 12 or 13 legends of ghosts there. And one of the strongest one is a priest. Uh, and he was the youngest son of the clan that was uh, that had built Lep Castle. And the clan was a really, really nasty uh, group of people. And they were constantly fighting with other clans. And what, what their kind of their modus operandi was is they would get other clans to help them fight this clan. Mm -hmm. And then after they would defeat the clan, everybody that helped them, they would invite them over for a big celebratory dinner. And that's kind of where um, uh, Game of Thrones got uh, the Red Wedding from. Oh. They would invite all their friends over and have a big meal. Mm -hmm invite them up to the bloody chapel as they call it now and slaughter them mm -hmm. in the, you know the house of worship on the on top of the the castle and so anyway this youngest priest uh, was kind of trying to vie to, to get um, power over the clan and the oldest brother his older brother uh, didn't like that too much and they had uh, service one day and the priest decided to go ahead and go with the service, which you never do until the leader of the clan gets there. It's a huge insult. So since he went forward, when his older brother got there, he charged in and killed the priest on the altar there. Hmm. And so the legend is this priest that occupies the bloody chapel in the, in the second floor of Lep Castle and wonders the halls and all that. So we got there and we're looking around and we spent about four hours there and I take some pictures, we do some EVP work uh, and everything was cool and, and um, the hosts, uh, Sean and Ann, they're the greatest people in the world and, and they we sat in their living room and he told stories and played his music and then we left. As we were living, leaving, uh, Tammy Cote, one of the uh, ladies that was with us, 
uh, stopped with us and we were all taking photos of Left Castle as we're leaving. And a couple of weeks later, uh, we look back at the photos and the photos, um, my description doesn't do it justice, but there's an arched doorway and Sean and Ann are standing in the arched doorway in front. On the second floor, there's a huge window that's the same size of this arched doorway, the same shape. In there, there is an image of a priest looking out the window. Whoa, it that's was, cool! I'll send it to you. I'll, 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 I need to put it on. Uh, I need to put it on my website. Yeah, you send uh, it to me here. We'll post it so you guys can see it too. Okay, I'll do that. And it's it's absolutely incredible. Um, Man. And you know, people will look at it and go, "Well, that's you know." It could be the clouds, that could be the, you know, off of the trees or reflection or whatever. That's why I keep going back to these places because, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, psychology and my amygdalas are firing off and trying to create pictures and right. getting pareidolia out of it. Yes, or right. Or whether there's something really going on, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, you know, throw the, the, the uh, flavor of the word or flavor of the day word out there, synchronicity. You know, I was standing exactly in the right spot mm -hmm. at the right time uh, for all of these natural occurring images to form a priest looking out the window. Wow. You know, I don't know. This is what I always ask people when they have experiences like that, because we always want to, you know, we like you said, pareidolia, or we, or we want to explain it away. My thing is, how do you feel? How did it feel? And how does it feel with looking at it now? What's what's that instinctual response you have to it? And that tends to be more of the answer. Do you remember what you felt like when you saw it? Were you like, oh my God? Oh yeah, he, he knew we were there. <laughs> yeah, see? And uh, he was watching and, you know, just sitting up there just going, I, I don't know, thanks for acknowledging. I don't know what he was Oh, doing. interesting. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I have a few things like that. Um, I have some more metaphysical, like spiritual kind of stuff. I was I was raised Catholic, so my brain is designed in, a, in such a way that it puts things together in a certain way. So you know that that's that's why I think I have more like spiritual experiences and metaphysical experiences than wow, there's a ghost. Ooh, did you hear what that EVP said? You know. I love that about you, Greg, and I would notice that too, reading about you as well, and what I've heard, because you guys, it's it's so true. So, okay, so ghosts exist. Okay, a lot of us watching the show believe in some kind of something like that, right? So what what's next? And the next part is what I think you're talking about, Greg. What? How does this spiritually take you? What, what, what's the next step of that? How's it, like I said, how does it leave you feeling? Do, does it help you evolve? Do you transform because of it? So maybe I would love to hear a little bit more about this, this spiritual or metaphysical experience and how that's different for you than maybe just, boo, a ghost. Yeah. Um, I... I I do not at all believe that I'm, um, that I have any sort of gift. I think that, though that that people that have a uh, a third eye or second sense or whatever you want to call it, uh, they're they're sensitives or they're mediums or they're intuitives or they're whatever it is. Um, I, I think some people are are born with with a, a heightened awareness like that, and I do believe that we're all equipped to be able to. Uh, study that and become better at it, uh, whether that, you know, be through Buddhism and meditation or, you know, ca you know, Catholic chanting or, or whatever, you have this spiritual uh, experience. Um, and I, uh, I, I probably the, the, the most powerful one I ever had is I was uh, going through a um, you were talking about my, my military uh, time. I, I did. Uh, yes. Army, then I did Navy, then I did Air Force, and it was, all of those were split up by uh, uh, law enforcement in between. And people were like, "What were you doing?" I was like, "I don't know. I was just, I just wanted to see what was going on, see what was, you know." And so when I was in Alaska, I was with a pararescue unit. Uh, mm. it, it was it was a, a Department of Defense pararescue unit, Department of the Interior for Alaska, and uh, the Army, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard loaned soldiers, uh, sailors, and, and airmen to this organization to build what's called ASAP. It's Arctic Subarctic Aquatic Pair Rescue. Neat. And uh, so we got together, we created all the policies and procedures and how we we're gonna do the water rescues and all that stuff. 
in the Arctic, which is a, a little, uh, it's, it's fairly unique. Wow. So we were going through a, uh, an airborne extraction uh, school in Kodiak with uh, Coast Guard helicopters. And so um, the water was very cold. It was, it was in the 40s, you know, the very, very low 40s, uh, high, high 30s probably. And uh, so I was fairly used to swimming in cold water. And uh, we, we finished our school. That was early on Friday or so. And I had to be back at Fort Richardson. Well, I, they, they gave me three days, you know, to be back on, on Monday. And so I decided I was going to go to a place that I had read about. Now, remember, this is uh, 1983, 84. Okay. So you actually had to go to historical societies, museums, libraries mm -hmm. uh, to actually read things out of things that they used to call books. They're made out of paper and they have, a, right. they have words in them. Yeah. Not a and, screen. Uh, not a screen you touch and move. No. But you had to go know, through the Dewey know, Decimal hey, System. Tell me about Bigfoot, you know, and, and do that. It, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> and so you'd actually have to do work to do that. So I went to his historical society there in Kodiak and, and, you know, all that was started with the Russians. A lot of people don't realize that you had the, the elute native Americans that were there. Um, and uh, then the Russians came in and did horrible things to those people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and one of the things was, is there was a place where this, uh, this tribe of people would go to whenever they were attacked. Uh, and, um, it, it, it's, a, a little outcropping on what's called Sit Kaladak Island, hmm. and uh, it's uh, refuge rock. It's uh, it, I can't pronounce the uh, the Native American uh, word for it, but it's um, it, it it means the place where one goes numb. Hmm. And so I go and I get an Alaskan Uber in uh, 1983 or 84, whenever this was an Alaskan Uber in 1983 84 was the least drunk guy with a private plane at the airport, right? Wow. So find that guy, give him 30 bucks, and he'd fly you to the next town or whatever, right? So I, I got him to fly me to Old Harbor, which is a town close to the Sit Kaladak Island. When I got there, that's a complete different story. I wrote, wrote about that in Diaries of Paranormalists. Mm. Uh, but it's just really weird because it's, you know, 17th, 18th century Russian. The, the buildings and oh, stuff. Interesting. And it's in Alaska. It's just weird. Okay. Uh, uh, and so I go and I stay at the Bates Motel. You know, <laughs> like little, Scary like enough. Like hot. Yeah. And, uh, and talked to some uh, some fishermen and they gave me a ride over Sit Kaladak Island. And then I had to walk across the strand to be able to see Refuge Rock um, off in the distance. And uh, w when I got there, um, you know, I'm all by myself and I had about, I had about 10 hours there and it was in the summertime, but it was still, everything was gray. Uh, the waves were about two foot swells, not, not too bad. And as I, I was there by myself, I, I can't, I'm, I don't want to go into it too, uh, there you go. Okay. Um, it's okay. I don't want to get into it too much because it's really emotional. And anyway, what happened there was all these people went out to Refuge Rock. And the Russians got their ships on either side of the rock and bombarded the rock uh, with cannon. And uh, basically killed everybody. And the, the women that were there, and, and we know this because... There was a Dutch explorer in the late 1700s that went there and actually interviewed some of the survivors that, that swam away from the island. Okay. And uh, the women were throwing their children from the cliff mm. so that the Russians wouldn't get a hold of them because they would, they would make them slaves. Mm. Uh, and so they used bracketing fire on uh, the people there and the numbers are, are a little bit different. It could have been 500, it could have been 2,000. Uh, but they pretty much wiped them out. Captured all the rest of them, brought them into slavery. And anyway, when I was sitting there, um, wh whenever I think about it too much, I get real weird. <laughs> so, little, I don't know what that is. But Well, um, I, I think it's what we're talking about. This is when you have a spiritual or metaphysical experience, it becomes more emotional. This is when you start using your barometer of your body. So, no, go ahead. I, I totally get it. Yeah. And, uh, and, 
being a good soldier, sailor, uh, cop, uh, uh, I, I tend to press that down as much as I can, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, so, um, I was there and I knew I was supposed to swim out to the rock. Now the rocks probably 300 yards from there. I could easily make that swim in that water. Um, it would have been a different story, probably getting out of the water and being able to try to dry off and stay warm even though it was summertime it was still 50 degrees mm -hmm. the water was you know and i was looking and i looked behind me uh and part of the sand you can tell where there's been an excavation there and it looks like to me that maybe the Aleut people dug dirt and put it in, in rocks and put it into the water and actually made a little roadway that goes out to the island, but it's underwater. Oh. So when the water is down, you could walk out there. Wow. Uh, you can see it when, if you if you look it up on Google Earth, uh, uh, Refuge Rock, uh, Sitkaladak Island, uh, Alaska, you can see from uh, um, uh, Google Earth, you can see that little road that goes out there. And so I knew I was supposed to be out there. So I started my way out there. Um, and I've been swimming a lot in that water and there's a lot of animals in that water. Um, and I was all by myself and I probably made it, I don't know, man, maybe 75 yards out there and it was getting up to my waist and the waves were a little bit bigger out there and it was cold and I got scared. Uh oh. And I turned around and I went back. And I wasn't brave enough to get all the way out there. So it's a very, uh, I don't, I don't know what I was supposed to do, but I knew I was supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. So maybe one day, maybe I'll go back out there. It's protected now. It wasn't protected back then. Uh, it's a, and on the national registry and all that stuff now. Uh, but it was a very, very interesting situation. Uh, for me, that I really, you you, you felt that emotion at the time, right? You felt that emotion there too, didn't I you? I feel it now. Yeah, <laughs> that that that's what I'm talking about. This is when you go, okay, so there's ghosts or there's paranormal activity. Okay, what does that mean to me? Where does that transform me or take me? And this is what we're talking about. This is it. That's a great example. It's that emotion. You've got some, and I'm by the way, I'm very sensitive. I'm getting I'm getting an emotional response. And I'm starting to get images too, just from your story. So it's those kinds of things, people, that, that I'm, I'm trying to talk about that, that help you develop more into the abilities of, of your sensitivities. And so you, you, you know what, Greg, you have the, you, you definitely are an empath. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you, you're an empath. This is what the emotion's about. That's really cool. So it's, it's stories like that that remind you your connection to humanity, remind you your connection to the past. And really, as you know, uh, I guess I will say um, the th cosmic theory is that everything's kind of happening right now anyway. So it's like you're, you're not really that far from your past or from the future. It's all right now. So somehow it's like you, you I'm going to call this like a... a um, a time slip. I know Rosemary Ellen Guiley talked about those time slips, and it's almost like that. You get in that, and you can feel the emotion of that time. Brilliant, brilliant story. Oh, I can. If I think a little bit about it, I can put myself right there, and I'm not ready yet. Yeah. So. Um, interesting. I have some things, some thoughts about that myself. Uh, you know, maybe there was a lifetime that you were there too. You never know. Um, mm -hmm. Just a thought I had. It was. It was really interesting. So it, we we. We were in uh, France, uh, what, 2019, I guess. I was there with uh, Nikki Folsom, I was, uh, Dave Schrader, and a bunch of other people there. And we went to um, uh, Chateau Fougaret. Okay, and I would think that it would be Chateau Fougaret, but I've heard people, French people pronounce it as Chateau Fougaret. Oh, anyway, okay. very quickly, it's a, uh, a very small castle uh, more like a mansion, a uh, fortified mansion that the French made uh, during their war with, uh, I think it was a hundred years war with, with uh, Britain. And uh, it was up on this hill and they're overlooking a river. Uh, and they were watching the Britons uh, build this big siege tower and stuff mm -hmm. over there uh, at the river. So they built this thing 
and I can equate it to it was like a a police substation. Okay. Uh, the soldiers would be there and they would uh, observe, and then they would go out and they would try to capture uh, British soldiers that were out foraging, and they would bring them back, torture them, and the, uh, they have a little uh, torture chamber in there, and then they have another dungeon that they actually buried some people in. And while we were there, um, they had some mediums come in, and uh, it was really weird because this, uh, this, this medium's doing a, a reading on four of us, uh, and I typically don't do readings, I just don't. <laughs> And, but I was there with other people. I'm just kind of there. And she turns around and looks at me and she goes, she was speaking, yeah, she was speaking French and she had an interpreter, but she broke, did broken English. She says, you were a fisherman, oh. but not of fish. You were a sailor. And anyway, so she, she goes off on this thing and I'm just listening to her. And it's real weird because I am a fisherman, but not a fish. Um, I'm I'm an underwater recovery team specialist. That's and right. Go recover bodies, right? And uh, at, a, at, at where I work, we we have about thirteen or so uh, a year, mm. and so do that for twenty years. Mm. And how many people you know you, you've fished out of the water? Wow. And so she says, I, you know, she, and she's saying all this stuff and there's no way she didn't, she can't get that from my website. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm always skeptical on, on when somebody's a little bit too close and she was spot on, man. She said, oh, yeah. wow. other than she said, I was a ladies man. Said, what? You're a ladies man. You're a sailor. You're a ladies man. <laughs> my wife was like, oh. I'm sure that goes over well, you know, with your wife. Oh, Dang! Well, you know, with Greg, that's crazy. I mean, that's spot on. I mean, yeah, and, well, and, and I, I don't want to go off into it because we go a long way. But yeah, she she had this whole string of things. I'm just going, you know, that's got to for her to do that. She would have had to have talk and talk to Dave Schrader and said, hey, "Oh, and get tell some me deep everything information about this guy so I can you. trick him." You know, because it was amazing. He would have. She would have been, been, been a so. plant. He would have had to, you know, pay pay her money or something to do that as a joke. I wouldn't put that past Dave. No, just kidding. I, I know he wouldn't do that. But well, he's like that, you know? Um, so that's interesting. So it's like, did that shift you or change you when you started hearing this information? Did you go, well, maybe there's something to this? So, well, so I don't know what mediums do. I don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. um, but I know they do something different than what other people do. And if we all did the same thing, we would miss a lot. That's um, right. People ask me, you know, you ever use mediums in, in doing criminal cases? Yeah. I have after I've exhausted all other methods of investigation. Okay. I've collected as all the testimony, all of the evidence, gone through everything, uh, don't have any place else to go. And my thought behind it is, let's say there's nothing. Let's say this is a, this is nothing more than Big Bang stuff coalesced, grew some moss, some water got on there, made an ocean. We crawled out and went to big, you know, McDonald's. <laughs> um, and wow. Uh, let's say it's just that. Well, I'm still going to use a medium because they think differently than I do. Mm -hmm. Their line of logic is different. Their, their approach to things are different. And that will spur me to think about things that I haven't thought about. Oh, um, hmm. I don't believe that. I believe there's something more to this. And I don't know whether that's just me saying by faith going, God, I hope there's something more to this or whether there, there's something more to this. Things happen weirdly and I, I can't make heads or tails out of it. Um, so I, I don't know what they do, but I know that we can learn a lot from that. I, I, I find it interesting, the people that are really hard on mediums. And then on Sunday, will uh, you know, go to their local Catholic church or, or Bible church or whatever and talk to the priest there about their problems. It's like, okay, so you talk to them there, you give them money, but talking to this person over here and giving them $20 for a reading is bad and is dumb and shouldn't be done you know it's like ah, duh. well you know you, you, you actually between cult you, yeah and religion is followers that's ah. 
Okay, that's, that's very, yeah, very is. well said. Well, you, you, you know, you walk a fine line. I mean, here you are working line with, you know, the law enforcement and, and being a policeman and a cop kind of thing, detective. And then here's the, and then you, you're doing this paranormal stuff, the investigations, and you, and you travel with all of us, <laughs> you know, doing these shows and, and talking about the investigations. You, you're around a lot of empaths, psychics, mediums, and people that do this work. So you, you, you really have to kind of walk in both sides and not go too far in either. I mean, you kind of have to, right, for your level of work? So... You can write a fiction novel or you can write, you know, a true crime novel. Um, that's something that I have to make sure that is very defined in my career uh, because if I go to a court and, they, yeah. you know, and, and I'm, I'm bleeding over one way or the other, that cannot look uh, good at all. So I am very crystal clear on what my job is in law enforcement uh -huh. and I'm very crystal clear on what my interest is in the paranormal. Yeah. And so I more likely bleed over the law enforcement side into the paranormal side to try to help people uh, conduct better investigations. Uh, Great. We, we were, we were just up in uh, um, uh, Belvoir winery up mm. in Liberty, uh, Missouri. And um, I, I was, you know, we were broke up that night into different ghost hunts and I was over in the hospital, not myself and Dave Schrader were over in the hospital. Uh, and we would do some stuff downstairs Then I would go upstairs. We kind of split the group. Um, and everybody was wanting to do EVP work. Everybody's wanting to do EVP work. Everybody had their, can mm -hmm. their, uh, recorders out and they're wanting to do that. Um, and I had to remind everybody that your investigation, uh, dictates how you, how you go about it based on your location, not on what you want to do. Great. Uh, because where we were, we were in that hospital all the way closest to where the neighborhood is, and they were having a party in the neighborhood, and so they were coming upstairs, sitting down, putting their recorders out, and mm. doing EVP work, and I'm like, hey guys, you can do that <laughs> if you want to. Um, it's not gonna be legitimate. Whatever you hear on your EVP, is going to be attributed to these people over here having the party because I can hear them crystal clear. <laughs> um, and some of the people just elected to do it anyway. And I just thought, you know, you got a spirit box, you can you can mess with that. Uh, you got so many different other things that you can do. You got a, that would be a good time for a Ouija board. I agree. Um, uh, you, you know, so your your location is going to dictate to you how you're going to go about your investigation, not the other way around. You're not going to dictate that's, to your location, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. Otherwise, you're going to be that ghost hunter that's just pissed off <laughs> because everybody won't be quiet. I'm trying to do an EVP. Shut okay, up. Everybody else is here doing stuff too. So we're all paying the same as, as you are. And, that's a good uh, rule of thumb. Okay, so that I would, you, you really jumped the gun here. I wanted to, for, for you guys, I wanted you guys in the audience to we'll probably learn a little bit more about what you could do yourself. You want to use some of his techniques because he, you know, he's a law enforcement officer. He knows how to investigate. He's a detective and then he does paranormal investigation. So rule number one is let the environment dictate what you're going to do, how you're going to go about it. Just give us some more tips and techniques that we can use. Yeah. You don't want to have a preconceived notion of, of how you're going to do the investigation because once mm. you get to the location, it could be completely different than what you're expecting. And now you try to force, something into the investigation that's that's it's not going to you're not going to get the evidence that you want or, or in the case of evp you're not going to get a clean evp uh and nobody's going to believe you because i mean it's like you're going to hear all this stuff so th there's uh you know there's a bunch of different ways to, to go about it your different tools just think about how your tool operates and whether you want to use it or not if if you're going to use some sort of tool that uh works on the electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. let's say uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Let's, uh, um, I, I guess it, it doesn't it doesn't matter if any of them it, that you're using that works on the electromagnetic spectrum, and then you go into a modern building, uh, especially let's say an office building that you know used to be something else, and now it's a, a bank or that's not a good example. They're not going to let us in the bank at two o'clock in the morning, are you? <laughs> um, like a regular <laughs> office building or something. Um, you're going to have all of these conduits all over the place and you're going to have, you know, oh, fiber wire, you're going to have you're right. wire. And if you're using something that is, is measuring the magnetic uh, electromagnetic spectrum, well, you're going to get all kinds of false readings. 
Mm. So maybe that's the time that you do the EVP thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or you do the board thing. Or Frank's uh, box, maybe, or Ovalisk. Right. And, uh, and like a, a perfect example uh, to, to do something along the electromagnetic spectrum line of it uh, would be in abandoned buildings because you're not going to have oh. you know, naturally occurring electricity in there. And you're going to have electricity in your body and you're going to have electricity in your phone. Uh, and if you don't isolate your phone someplace, mm. you know, people go, well, I just put it on airplane mode. I don't know, man. Um, law enforcement does a lot of stuff with, uh, you know, phones that are placed on airplane mode and locked. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's probably a better idea if you had leave it out in the car or um, get some sort of isolating bag, a lined bag that's not going to let those emissions get out of there. Uh, but, I mean, I'm getting real into it. And, well, you know, uh, that's a good point because a lot of people take their phones on investigations. They want to see if they get pictures or use it for EVPs or they use little apps on there. So, that you know, that thought didn't cross my mind, actually. I have my phone with me when I do investigations, but you bring up a great point about that. Yeah. So, wow. Some people, you, know, you just got to remember all the other stuff that's running in the background on your phone. Uh, and you're people right. say, well, you know, I turned all that stuff off, and I say, no, you didn't. Yeah, no, you didn't. You're absolutely right. <laughs> uh, you can think you did, but uh, you didn't. And so it's it's interesting. I use a lot of those tools to isolate what's not there. So as a paranormal investigator, uh, I you know, I look at what's not there as mm. opposed to looking for what is there. It's a, it's a different, it's a really different concept. So like when we're doing a body recovery in zero visibility water, just mud, mm -hmm. right? And we're down there and we're not sure where they are uh, and we're just down there feeling, right? We're going back and forth. We sweep our hands, sweep it back, do wow. a little push up off the ground, move ourselves a, a foot forward, sweep back, push off, move yourself forward. So you're just kind of inchworming along down the bottom there. We're not trying to find the body. I know that's the, the goal, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to show you that the body's not here. So we're oh. gonna eliminate areas where the body's mm. not. It, it's, it's a hard concept to, to get through when you're talking about paranormal, but sometimes it's what's not there that's the most interesting. Um, wow, so, very good by eliminating, by using some of your tools to eliminate the normal, the paranormal should be floating around someplace. I always find it interesting that people use normal means, all these electronic gadgets, to look for paranormal evidence. <laughs> it is really funny. Well, I, I see. I, I think of that too. Um, I, I'll tell you what I like to use. I like to use my own body. Like I said, I like to feel. Yeah. I like to feel the energies change. I like to feel the coldness. I like to feel the different, maybe a breeze. I like to see if I hear something. Or if, so I tend to use my body as my. I'm a walking Ouija board, Greg. That's what I am. <laughs> but I mean, so you got to look at that. I think you're bringing up some great points. So what would you say in a paranormal investigation is your favorite tool if you're using a tool? Uh, an analog recorder or a, uh, it's nice to have an analog video. Uh, right now my analog video does not work. Uh, I'm gonna have to get another one. Uh, but I typically just do like a GoPro kind of camera. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, And a uh, digital and on analog audio. I I'm with you. Um, I see people spend thousands of dollars to fly to Europe, uh, stay in nice hotels, uh, transportation to go into a castle for four hours and walk around and stare at an electronic screen mm -hmm. and they're looking for the ghost they're looking for the ghost <laughs> and I'm constantly telling people put away your gadgets you just spent four thousand dollars on a trip to come over here and look at this stuff have the experience man mm. let your brain work let your senses work go walk down that really long hallway with no lights on dark and watch the shadow people come out mm -hmm. they'll be there I, I whether it's I know whether it's your amygdalas <laughs> trying to make faces or you know threaten shapes and stuff like that or it's something else I don't know but have those experiences don't live your life through electronic technology mm. my opinion 
Very interesting. You're kind of like old school, like me. <laughs> I I prefer uh, I prefer non-electrical stuff. I I, prefer, I obviously we have to use electrical stuff to record anything that we're doing, mm -hmm. record whatever that experience is. Um, but you know, searching for stuff if if it's if it's paranormal, then it's not normal. So if we're looking for the <laughs> electromagnetic spectrum and somebody says, well, you know, a spirit or whatever it is disrupts the electromagnetic spectrum and that's what we're looking for. It's not the ghost emanating the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the ghost pushing on the electromagnetic spectrum mm -hmm. and, and creating some sort of effect out of it. Uh, okay, that's evidence that you believe that this is a theory and that's how it happens. Um, I think we're already equipped. I, I do we're too. Already equipped to to have these experiences, and if we just would record the experiences we have in in some way, uh, that would be really good evidence. Because you know, I was so excited back in the '90s with the the skyfish, the flying rods. Do you remember the flying rods? Yep. Yep. Oh that was when it first came out. The man. rods, the shadow people, and the rods. Yeah. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And I was like, okay, wait, that's a really slow camera rate with a butterfly flying by, <laughs> you know, flapping his wings seven times. And he looks like a rod with this weird freaking thing, right? That was let down. I really thought we had some aliens going on here. We we're going to uh, find some sort of new species. Or okay, something. but what do you think about orbs? So I have a picture when I was in uh, the... When I was in Lep Castle in the, uh, the Bloody Chapel up there, I have a, oh. uh, a photograph of me with about a thousand orbs around oh. me. It's amazing. They're not There's, dust particles? Of course. Um, <laughs> you know, the Bloody Chapel is the second most dusty place on the planet next to the red, you know, like a, the, the Mediterranean or something. I don't know. I, it was dusty. But it looks great. You look at it and you're like, oh, man, look. You know, look, all your grandmas are there to, to visit you, you know, <laughs> you know? and uh, no, it's, it was all, all, you know, particles or you know, okay. some, some sort. Of, yeah. Uh, but it looked great. Don't, I don't want to take away from, you know, I don't yeah, want to yeah, ruin yeah. the story with logic. Listen, uh, you're, you're a detective. Was... <laughs> you, you've got to use your mind first. Now I got to tell you, Greg, I was up at East City Ranch, which is owned by James Gilliland. And they have, up there. have you been up there? No, I haven't. You need to go up there. Okay, so I went up there, did a whole video. You guys are, know, if you did miss that video, um, I could put a link below for you guys. But also, you could just go look at my adventures at East City Ranch. I filmed orbs all over the place, moving around, interacting with us, little faces. I mean, it was crazy. Wow. But since then, I have seen orbs, um, not with my naked eyes, but with, uh, I have a um, night vision camera. or go I should night vision goggles I have. They're, they're made, the police, Border Patrol uses them. <laughs> I mean, I bought some really cool night vision goggles. I'm sure you use them for your work. So I'm looking through it, and um, I was with my board partner, Rodney, you guys. He was looking through them like this. Our friend Jack is a cop, and we're looking over Jack's head. We're like this, and he's like, oh, my God, Karen, you're not going to be this. He's doing this, and I'm like, what? He hands them to me, you guys. I look, and I see this giant orb the size of a basketball went over our friend Jack's head, Boo, just kind of went like this. Then it went ding, 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 zoop, shot off across my pool. You guys swear to God. Now, I would tell you the story, but if we didn't have a witness there that actually saw it too, just one huge one, it wasn't dust particles, you guys. It was not. <laughs> so I have that experience, Greg. And and he yeah. said it was a bunch of little ones around there. But um, I got to bring this up because, you guys, Greg is also into cryptids. And I wanted him just to talk a little bit about Sasquatch. But when I was up at East Setting, I I think I mentioned it on the video to you guys if you watch that show. Um, it was in the night, and I heard I was staying in the tents one night, and I heard an elk snort and growl. You know how they go, wah, wah. you know, they make this double sound like a whistle and a growl kind of, uh, uh, you know, guttural thing. I heard that, and then about I don't know several minutes later, I heard the most obnoxious scream, deep, high, a little bit of every range coming in. I had never heard anything. I was like kind of scared. <laughs> and I was like, what is this? And I was with Susan Cummins and a lot of, you know, Susan Cummins and a lot oh, of yeah. those. Yeah. He's what he's a, she's a mutual friend of ours. And anyway, she was there with me and she's like, she's sleeping. I'm like, Oh my God, wake up. She's like, what? I go, you didn't hear it. because I heard nothing. I'm sleeping. I'm like, Oh my God. So I wait till you, the morning. You got Susan Cummins in a tent. Yes. 
she, listen, what? Listen, we were we were at the we stayed in the yurts first, you guys, and we decided to switch to these new cabins. The new cabins we stayed there one night, but they were freshly painted, so it was just too much fumes. So she agreed to go next the next night into the tents. She wow! Did, I know she did great as a camper. Well, this, yeah, well, she, she's a trooper. She's awesome. She's she's like a survivalist. She's got all this stuff that's for the you know batteries that work off the sun for your whatever you got to you know. She had everything with her, you guys. I had I just brought my little sleeping bag. You know, I was like, let's go, and my Ouija board, of course. But you guys, I didn't know what that was. To this day, I still don't. So I told everybody at the camp. I told James Gilliland, and they're like, oh, that's Sasquatch. I don't know, you guys. I didn't see him or see it, but it was a. I'd never heard a sound. And I used to can't grow up camping, you guys. So I don't know what that was, Greg. But tell us about what you want to say about Sasquatch, what you know about Sasquatch. So um, I, I, had, I had made a pitch uh, a couple of years ago. We were going to do a, uh, um, a project to go look for Sasquatch. Um, but we were going to do it in a way that I, I put together a team of people that that's what they do for a living. They mm -hmm. hunt things, mainly other people. So, ah. you know, all these groups have gotten anthropologists to go look, zoologists, big game hunters, hobbyists, scientists, all this stuff to go find Bigfoot. They haven't found him yet. So why repeat the, the same thing over and over again? Because that's what's going on. Same thing's going on in ghost hunting. I agree. Now. People are just repeating the same <laughs> thing and nobody's thinking outside the box or returning to our roots on where all this stuff started to begin with. But, so uh, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll pull my CIA buddy in. He uh, mm. electronically looks for people. I'll pull in a Delta Force guy that would go, you know, Ooh. hunt down Osama bin Laden. I'll pull in a Special Forces guy, a SEAL, uh, um, a pararescue guy, mm. and myself as a former SWAT guy uh, who does felony warrants. We go and look, all of those groups, that I just mentioned, one of their jobs is to go find people that don't want to be found. And so let's go ahead and up the up the game a little bit with Sasquatch here. Obviously, he's a lot smarter than everybody else uh, because if he's here, mm -hmm. they haven't been able to found, find him, so he's outsmarted him. So maybe, maybe we need to think on a different level. You know, there's the theory of He's a shapeshifter. He's a right. uh, dimensional being. He's right. a time traveler. He's an alien. Uh, you know, he's he, whatever. So that was the the way I was going to go. Hmm. Um, and that project didn't get uh, didn't get done. Uh, but Russell Acord, yeah, with a, a travel channel, Expedition Bigfoot, mm. uh, they're doing something very similar to that uh, as far as using technology and also using algorithm uh, to see where ah. all the sightings are and then predict where his next appearance might be. Mm. So uh, if, if, you haven't, if you haven't watched Travel Channel's Expedition Bigfoot, I, re I recommend it. Um, it's, it's real neat the way that they're doing it uh, and the way that they're going about it. So very cool. I would have loved to have seen you do it with your with your your team. That'd have been really cool. Yeah, it would have been very expensive. <laughs> my guys, my guys True. are really expensive, and uh, you know, doing uh, uh, non scripted TV doesn't you know it doesn't always pay that that good. So uh, could you do that uh, again? Yeah, like, well, do it again. Do it again. They were like, can you can you find some people that you know don't cost so much? I'm like, not with the credibility these guys have. Right. You know, it depends on what you want. I can go down on the corner all day long and find vets down there that will damn sure want to go out in the woods and go hunt Bigfoot. But what about the credibility? You know, what's their background? What's their history? What's their resume? You know, what's their bio? Yes. So um, one, one of the things that really got me interested, once again, I, I default back to Alaska. Um, I'm, I'm reading about all this stuff and I read about this town that all of a sudden everybody in the town packed up and moved hmm. because of the Bigfoot murders. What? Yep. Um, so it's uh, it's a uh, it's it's no longer a town. It's a ghost town now. Um, it's it's Port. Uh, well, so there, there's Port Lock, Alaska, which is the little town, and then there's Port Chatham, which is the port there. Uh, and had a, a salmon uh, oh. cannery 
and had a, a territorial school there, had a post office, uh, and had about 50 uh, homes there that uh, they worked at the cannery and supported, supported the cannery. And in the late 1940s, the whole town packed up and left. Um, nobody really, there, there's no writing about any of that. The, the town just disappears and then uh, the post office disappears off the registry in the 19, in 1950 or so. Okay. Uh, and then a, a article pops up in the uh, Anchorage newspaper uh, in the 1970s about everybody evacuating this town due to a series of murders that happened there. Oh, so wow. I end up um, talking some Coast Guardmen into taking their boat uh, and going down to uh, Portlock. And we spent about four hours, you know, rummaging around there. And uh, sure enough, there was a town there. Everything's pretty much fallen in. There's one cabin that was still up when I was there. Part of the cannery was still up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, machines found in the graveyard, but there, there's no access. The only way you can get in there is by boat or by airplane. But how do they know Bigfoot is, is, the, is the one, at, the criminal at large? Well, how do they know? The, the, that's the local uh, um, uh, indigenous people there attributed these murders to what's called a tornet or a hairy man. Yeah, hairy so man, they, these, right. Yeah. And uh, so w when you start looking at stuff like that and you start uh, uh, disassembling the legend, you know, other things pop up. So, you know, okay. was it a serial killer? Killed a bunch of people? Uh, did all those murders happen close together or did it happen over a 40-year period? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know because... The, the uh, Alaskan uh, state police was uh, actually created in the 60s. Now remember, Alaska oh, wasn't even a state that's right. in the 1950s. That's right. Okay. Right. So, yep. <laughs> so they had, they had 30, prior to that, they had 30 territorial police up there that just kind of went around. But if you wanted to kill somebody, that'd be the place to go. You mm. know, they, they wouldn't figure it out up there. There's no way. I mean, all you have to do is leave the body out, and everybody's going to eat it. Oh, my gosh. Listen, I, I don't want to ruin my that. vision of, of Sasquatch. I just love Sasquatch. Yeah. Well, um, in Alaska, there's a lot of stories of Sasquatch that are very violent. Um, he's no joke up there. He 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 doesn't like uh, human encroachment up there. Interesting thing, there, there's, there's stories of uh, when, when these stories came out, uh, Europeans, white people, would call uh, the indigenous people of Alaska Eskimos. Right. Uh, they, they said that the Eskimo. Well, I mean, that's just what we. Yeah, they're, they're they're Inuits mostly, right? Right, Aleuts, Inuits. Yeah. Uh, and but they didn't know that. No, they didn't no, know of the course language, not. Language, so I was like, oh, I'm going to call you an Eskimo. Right. <laughs> and so. Um, there are stories, you know, and it's that's all that. Uh, unfortunately, it's all uh, you know. Um, it's hearsay because it's just passed along in an oral tradition, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it would make complete sense to me. It makes complete sense that uh, the Eskimos or the Aleuts or the Inuits that were there actually got along with the hairy people a few thousand years mm -hmm. ago. Hairy people were over there. They were over here. They actually did some trade. And the, the legend goes... The reason that the split happened is one of the younger hairy people uh, stole one of their canoes because the hairy people didn't have the the craftsmanship or the knowledge to be able to make a canoe, and he stole one of the canoes, and there was a big problem, you know, a big fight happened out of that, oh, and then they split. Um, interesting. Which, you know, uh, I mean, we crossbred uh, Homo sapien, Homo, ha you know, all these different right. So whatever, we crossbred with Neanderthals. Right. I'm percent Neanderthal. Look at this. I, I, no, I can tell you are. You're the missing link, right there. There he is. Right. <laughs> and so you know that this was happening. So why wouldn't it have happened over here? You know why? Why wouldn't uh, there possibly be some sort of very tall human that had was very hairy, mm -hmm. uh, and 
I, I just don't don't see an impossibility in that. Good. Well, I don't either. And you know, like you're talking about the legends, and it's around the world. There's legends of these giant people, not not just giants. That's a whole other story. But it's these hairy people, where it's the Yeti, the Bumble Snowman, the Hairy Man, Sasquatch. What the different names they have for? But the all the native tribes have some kind, even in China, some kind of being that's like this. So I, I'm with you on that. That the the traditions are all coming together, and they're saying there's this yeah. being out there. So. Interesting. Well, listen, you, you look at things as a true detective, so we appreciate that about you. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully, you know, the first part of the show, you said I was a police officer. That You might get a lot of people just, uh, like, not watching after that. Tuning out. No, <laughs> like, no. Gonna They're going to go, police, man. They're, she's having a police officer on the show. Uh. You're the first one, by the way. Well, listen, <laughs> um, that was pretty much the, our whole show, you guys. I was just so happy you guys could meet Greg and hear from him. Greg, what do you have coming up for you? Um, where can people find information about you? This is your time to share your links. So the best way to go is, is just go to my website, uh, theparanormaldetective.com is the easiest way. You can find me on, uh, on uh, Facebook. I'm, I'm fairly active on Facebook. Yep. We got, what, Mission come, um, um, Michigan coming up. Yep. Uh, latter part of August. I have uh, Savannah coming up mm -hmm. in early part of September. Savannah is going to be really cool. Um, and then we have Bell Grove after that. You've got a few things this fall. So you guys, yeah. I'll have the links to his website down below and, and so you guys can check it out. But he has a lot of things going, going on. And by the way, you should check out his books too because especially how to become a, a paranormal detective, that how to be a paranormal detective, excuse me. That's some of the stuff he's talking about during this show. So Greg, listen, thank you so much for taking time out. I know I have a great evening when you work, but thank you for being here. We really appreciate your time today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And anytime. Thank you, Greg. So there you have it, you guys. Here is a gentleman who's actually out there working the streets and ways to help humanity and help the people. But it's interesting. He has a vision of being a detective and seeing things in a whole new light that he can also bring over to our paranormal world and help us understand to see things differently. So we may get to the truth, what's out there in the afterworld and beyond. Thank you guys for joining me. This is Creative Visions TV. I'm Karen, and I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.